Isaac Newton or certainly Galileo was the idea that if the God put the earth in the middle, we were the most important. And um, moving us from the center of the universe was a very painful psychological thing for many, many human beings. Um, I remember recently one of the Voyager uh, spaceships, satellite, left the um, solar system and wandered off into space. And it took a picture back of Earth from beyond Pluto. And there was this tiny little blue dot. I mean, we were tiny. Okay. And um, so it gives us um, a, a different feel. Now, in our galaxy, which is called the, the uh, Milky Way galaxy, in this galaxy, there are something like 250 billion stars. And in the universe, there are anywhere between 200 billion and a trillion galaxies. And every single second, 4,800 approximately, new stars are formed every second. Um, it's just a staggering to me at least, staggering thought. Now, um, it, it has happened often in history that when times are propitious um, and circumstances are right, you get a group of certain people who can make great progress. And this proved especially true in the late 16th and early 17th centuries with the appearance of three great minds Tycho Brahe, Johannes Kepler, and Galileo Galilei, okay? all working on similar problems uh, at roughly the same time. Brahe, as we uh, saw yesterday, or I mentioned yesterday, died in 1601. He died in considerable agony, un unfortunately. The cause of his death was uremic poisoning, which of course uh, is, is a condition where the kidneys refuse to, to uh, remove uh, waste products from the blood. Um, and he had an assistant working for him at the time whose name was Johannes Kepler. Kepler, the youngest of these three people, was born in 1571. Brahe was the oldest, born in 1546. And Galileo, as we shall see in the middle, in 1564. Kepler was working for Brahe and was there at, the, at, at his death. Um, and he wrote that Brahe was at the dinner table and needed to go away to urinate, but he was too polite to leave the table because he was in conversation with some young women. Uh, and so his bladder burst, he said, and that killed it. And that's all nonsense, obviously nonsense. But, I mean, who the hell knew about uremia 400 years ago? <laughs> you know. um, but all sorts of conspiracies and theories have arisen over the years. We human beings are very good at that sort of thing. Kepler was an extraordinarily clever man, an extremely good mathematician. Um, Brahe was an extraordinary man and a very good observer, but a bad mathematician. And Brahe, as we will see, had hired Kepler to do the, the mathematical calculations. And what he wanted Kepler to do was to prove his own theory of the universe, which was that um, the sun, that all of the outer planets from Mars out to, to Saturn revolved around the sun, but that the sun revolved around the earth, and the earth was fixed. Uh, and this is not Copernicus, of course, in which everything revolves around the sun. Kepler was a Copernican uh, and didn't believe in, in Brahe's theory. But um, Brahe, who, as I said, couldn't do much mathematics, had hired Kepler to, to um, try to, to, to prove that. Um, 
But Braha was very secretive man, and he didn't give Kepler access to his data, only leaking out little bits of data at a, t uh, at a time. And so, because we human beings are a suspicious bunch of SOBs, um, the, the suspicion arose over centuries that Kepler had poisoned or, or uh, somehow murdered Brahe in order to get his hands on the data. Um, and as in, in 1901, um, Brahe, by the way, died in Prague and is, uh, is buried in, in the cathedral in Prague. Uh, and uh, his body was exhumed in, in 1901, and an investigation was made which was inconclusive. He was exhumed again in 2010, as recently as that, and people looked for traces of mercury, thinking that, that Kepler had poisoned him. And um, completely crazy. Anyway, a tiny bit of mercury had, was found in, in the hair follicles, or, uh, actually of his beard, because guys like Kepler had great beards in those days. Uh, and there were some hair follicles left, and a little bit of mercury was found in them. But he had experimented with mercury in his youth. It's far from enough to kill him. Kepler is absolutely not guilty of anything. Uh, and he's, his genius can now be allowed to shine. Uh, he was a very ill child, um, and he had health problems and serious hearing problems. And having a serious hearing problem for the last 15 years of my life, I'm extremely sympathetic to that. Uh, Kepler was, uh, because of his ill health, uh, he was um, not able to graduate from the University of Tübingen until he was his old man of 17. Um, he was very good at maths, and he was deeply influenced by his math professor, who is Michael Mestlin. And Meslin was a great believer in Copernicus, and so was Kepler. Um, in 1594, the astronomical chair at the University of Graz in southern um, Austria fell open. Kepler had never uh, said anything about having any, and never expressed any interest in astronomy, but he was forced to take that chair, which isn't a bad thing for a young man of 23. Um, it was a year later when he was lecturing, and um, he was drawing figures on the board. Um, and he, he noticed a relation. If you take a triangle and you inscribe in the triangle a circle, and you inscribe around the triangle another circle, the ratio of those two circle areas is 2 to 1. Quite remarkable. Okay, and um, this two to one is very cl is close, but not equal to the uh, ratio of the orbital size of Saturn and of Jupiter and Saturn. Um, and so he tried looking at all of the other planets. It did not work very well, and so he went not from pl to p away from plane figures, and he went to solid figures. And there are a series of solid figures of interest. Why doesn't this thing work? Oh, it doesn't work because I didn't turn it on. OK. Um, there are a series of uh, which were invented by Plato. Uh, and you know, earth, air, fire, and water. And the fifth, which is composed of, of pentagons, uh, is, is the perfect substance, the ether, which occupies all of outer space. Um, these are the only figures you can make using only one kind of shape. So that, for example, in a round ball, a ray dome or a football, which are made of hexagons, you have to interpose a pentagon every once in a while. So it's not just one form, triangle, pentagon, square, triangle, triangle. Um, so he said for, that um, the Earth is a circle, the measure of all. Round it, describe a dodecahedron, the circle enclosing this will be Mars, and on and on he goes. And this was close to right. 
It's complete nonsense, but it's close to right. And Kepler was the last so-called humanist scientist. He was a deeply emotional man, uh, as we shall see. Um, he's Yeah, he declared, for example, that he would not exchange the glory of this discovery, even though it turned out to be wrong, for the entire electorate of Saxony. I mean, um, things did not work very well. But he published this in 1596, and lots of people noticed it, and it made his reputation. Now. Um, He um, sent these, these results to lots of, as I said, to lots of people. And Braha and, and, and Galileo both commented very positively of it. Um, Kepler was married twice. The first time um, to a 23-year-old Barbara Muller. At 23, she had been widowed twice. Um, that's. People married, I guess, quite young in those days. The two of them had five children together. Two died in infancy, as happened so painfully often. Three survived, one died in childhood, and it was a very unhappy marriage. Um, and she eventually died in 1611, so they had been married about 15 years. Um, and she died in, in a, a, a most unpleasant illness. Um, Kepler was a Protestant, and um, there were, but the city of Graz, where he was teaching, is a Catholic city, uh, and there were lots of problems. After all, the, the Thirty Years' War was to break out only in 1618, uh, uh, the huge war between Catholics and Protestants. Um, but Kepler had written in 1600 already looking for a new position. And he wrote to the uh, Viennese uh, emperor, who was Rudolf II, he wrote to, to the imperial mathematician, a man named um, Nicholas Baer, Reimars Baer, often called Baer uh, in English, or Ursus in Latin because of this name. Um, and he and Tycho Brahe had huge arguments over. Um, Brahe, of course, had moved to um, Prague in 1600, and they had huge arguments uh, about astronomy. Um, notice in this picture, he does not have a prosthetic nose, but he's got a spectacular mustache. Um, Anyway, he wrote to, uh, Kepler wrote to Baer. Uh, he did not write to Brahe. Um, and um, Baer used, his, it was a very complimentary letter, and Baer used that complimentary letter in his arguments uh, with Brahe. But because of this idea of the, the, the perfect solids, both of these men were very interested. And um, he also wrote. He never wrote back to Kepler, but he wrote to Kepler uh, with a very complimentary, uh, a very complimentary note. Um, but um, in 1600, he died, and he became the imperial mathematician. And he was an extraordinary observer, but as I think I've said, a, a rather mediocre med uh, mathematician. And so he hired Kepler to come and do um, the calculations to prove his theory. When um, Brahe died in 1601, Kepler took his position as imperial mathematician, and he had that position for 11 extraordinarily productive years. Uh, in principle, as, as imperial mathematician, he was well paid. But in reality, that was not true at all. Um, Rudolf, as any of you who, who have studied uh, the history of that period, was pretty crazy. And um, 
there were all kinds of wars going on, and the imperial treasury was uh, invariably um, empty. And so despite, in principle, having a good salary, he never got paid. And so he was often in, in uh, a great amount of debt. And he had to cast horoscopes and do things of that sort, which he did not like, in order to make a decent living. Um, what he did do in 1606, he published a very serious uh, work on uh, the theory of vision and what happens to light. Um, he was particularly interested in the refraction of light. Refraction of light, of course, being the change that a light beam uh, makes when it, it goes from one material into another. So from um, air into glass, or from air into water, or from glass into water, the angle of a light beam will change. And he created, he, he understood the theory, but he never gave a mathematical description of it. Um, despite the fact that it had been, this was in 1606, it had been already discovered by the uh, British mathematician Thomas Harriot in 1602. And a letter, and Harriot had sent a letter to Kepler, which was not acknowledged, but it had been originally discovered in the year 984, almost a thousand years before, by the Persian astronomer Ibn Sal. Uh, but it's not called after any of these people, it's called Snell's Law, after the Dutch mathematician Willebord Snellius, uh, who discovered it again in 1621, but he didn't publish it during his lifetime. So this question of um, attribution of discoveries is, uh, in science is, is, is pretty weird. Um, but every, every undergraduate in physics learns about Snell's Law, probably at school. Um, Kepler did a lot of interesting work on how the eye functions, and he understood, for example, that the image on the retina is upside down, of course, and the brain changes it. Now, I'm told you can get spectacles which will make us all look upside down, but that your brain will work hard and turn that around. Um, and I've always wanted to have a pair of spectacles such as that in order to try and see how long it takes the brain to, and whether people are horizontal for a while <laughs> as you go from this. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know. Anyway, um, <clears throat> Braha had done, uh, had been incredibly impressed by the appearance of a supernova in 1572, and that's what had started him on this astronomy thing. After he was dead in September 6, 1604, everybody saw yet another supernova. Uh, surpassing Jupiter in brightness and close to the as bright as Venus. And it lasted for several months before disappearing. And again, it did not have parallax, so it did not have a different angle uh, looked at from different positions. And so it was very far away. And so uh, in, in, it was not in where the planets were. It was where the fixed stars are. Um, In Prague and later, Kepler spent 17 years investigating the mathematical properties, uh, relationships between the five planets that we can see without a telescope. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. He worked mostly with Mars. Of these five planets, all of which move in ellipses, the most elliptical is Mercury. But Mercury is incredibly hard to see because it's so close to the sun, and you only see it right before dawn or right, uh, or right after dawn or right before sunset. Um, and therefore, it, it, its position comes through a great deal of, of um, air, and that causes um, the angle to change. It's really hard to work with. 
Uh, the next most elliptical planet uh, orbit is Mars. And that's the one that Kepler chose to work with. Um, and he worked, as I said, for 17 years. Um, and he derived from that his three laws of, of motion of planets. Kepler's first law is that the planets move not in circles. What a huge change this was. Again, a massive change in, in psychology because the circle is the most perfect of, of, of figures. And why would God make things not per as perfect as possible? But it moves, in fact, in ellipses. And el an ellipse has two foci, two, not one as a, as a circle does. And the sun sits at one of them. And here is the place closest to the sun called the perihelion, which where the motion is fastest. And here is the slowest at the aphelion. Okay. And the most elliptical of the planets, as I said, is, um, is Mars, uh, uh, or a visible planet. Then Kepler's second law, which is that equal areas are um, are, are covered in equal times. So and when you're close to the sun, you move very quickly and you get area X. When you're far from the sun, where this distance is long, you move slowly and you get area Y. And area X and area Y are equal. And this law is so powerful that it has become part of major physics, it is called the law of the conservation of angular momentum. It is a major, major discovery. And then the third law, which is there is a direct relationship. The square of the period of years is proportional to the cube of the major axis. There's the this, this distance, the semi-major axis. This is the major axis. This is the minor axis. This is the semi-major half. And so the cube of that distance is directly proportional to the square of the time it takes to go around. And so if you plot it like that, every single planet lies on that same straight line. Okay. So that from the Earth, which goes around in one year, and we get things like Jupiter, which takes um, close to 10 years, with the square of that being 100, et cetera. This is a funny scale, you notice. It's not a linear scale. It's the logarithmic scales, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, et cetera. Okay. Um, Copernicus had made, of course, the orbits perfect circles with the sun at the center and a constant speed. And that change from circle to ellipse was a major psychological thing. In the 1960s, when computers were incredibly slow, old fashioned, and I was using them, so I know. Um, somebody did Kepler's calculations. Kepler took 17 years to calculate this. He didn't do only that, obviously. He had to make a living. He did other things. But it took him 17 years. It took that old-fashioned computer to calculate these three laws eight seconds. Um, computers are much faster than the human brain. Um, by 1611, with the death of his wife Barbara, he had, he, he had all kinds of tragedies, the deaths of, his, of most of his children, including, I mean, two died in infancy, and his favorite son died as a young child. He had two children left, and he wanted to leave Prague. And he was offered a professorship of mathematics in Linz. Uh, 
uh, which he couldn't accept because Rudolf wouldn't let him go. Uh, Rudolf died in 1612, and he was reappointed uh, as imperial mathematician, but he was allowed at least to move to Linz. So he had two remaining children, 10 and 5, and he had a job. So as men did in those days, he asked friends to find him a wife to take care of his children. Um, they presented him with 11 possible women, <laughs> all of whom he interviewed. And as I said, he was a very um, emotional man. <laughs> and so uh, he wrote descriptions of them, which we still have. One was too old. One was in bad health. One was too proud of her birth. Another was of good family and fortune, but, as he said, her physiogn physiognomy is most horribly ugly. She would be stared at in the street, not to mention the striking disproportion of our figures. I am lank, lean, and spare, sheathed short and thick. In a family not notorious for fullness, she is considered superfluously fat. <laughs> Terrible. Some, anyway, um, so he went back to number five, and he married her. And that was a very happy marriage. Her name was Susanna, and she was a nice woman and took, obviously, good care of him. Um, they married and went to Linz, uh, and, and finances were always a problem. Uh, he had been offered a, a position in Bologna in Italy, but um, he rejected because the Italians, of course, are Catholic, and he was a Protestant, so he was afraid. Um, his fortune changed, however, uh, when in 1619, um, the Emperor Matthias, who was the brother of Rudolf, died, and he was replaced by another imperial emperor, Ferdinand III who confirmed his position as principal mathematician, promised to pay him his back salary, uh, and to provide for the publication of what he called the Rudolphine Tables. These, because he really knew how the planets moved, he could tell with great accuracy where the planets would be at any given time. And he called those the Rudolphine Tables after Rudolf, and he wanted to publish them and he was promised by Ferdinand that he would be able to publish them. And these are part of the glorious reputation of Kepler that still exists today. Um, the most significant thing that happened, of course, was in, by 1619 he had completed the three laws. And as I said, he was a super emotional human being. And so he wrote the following. I will indulge in my sacred fury, triumph over men. I have stolen the golden wages of the Egyptians to build a tabernacle for my God. If you forgive me, I rejoice. If you're angry, I can bear it. <laughs> it may. Uh, God has waited 6,000. Notice the universe is still only 6,000 years old uh, for an observer. I mean, this is the preface to the book that he published with the three laws in it. Um, scientists don't write like that anymore. Um, the was very upset that his book, which he took such pride in, was immediately uh, banned by the Catholic Church and put on the index of forbidden books. Um, and then, uh, an obviously emotional character, he got terribly frightened and was afraid for his personal s safety if he went, if he traveled to Italy. Is that talking again? <laughs> 
like thrown off, maybe that. Um, uh, he would, um, and then he was afraid that this uh, papal censure of his book would extend to Austria, which was largely uh, Catholic as well. Uh, and he was advised that this is all nonsense, but keep yourself within bounds, uh, he was told. The year 1620, right after this was published, was a horrific year in, in Central Europe because the Thirty Years' War was busily ra raging, and Germany and Austria were in the process of being devastated by this great war between Catholics and Protestants. Uh, he was visited by an Englishman, Sir Henry Wotton, who was the English ambassador to Vienna, and James I, who had replaced Elizabeth when she died in 1604. He was the Scot, James VI of Scotland, who became James I of, of Britain, um, made him an offer to move to London and become the um, court's um, uh, the, the court's astronomer. And he um, declined to move because he felt too much a German, so uh, he stayed there. Then an even more difficult time arose because he had a mother who was still alive, Catherine Kepler, and she was a very irascible woman. Um, in the, on the 5th of April in 1620, she was arrested on a very serious charge. She lived, she would, uh, lived in some little town um, close to Stuttgart, and she was accused by a neighbor uh, of poisoning her either directly or through witchcraft. Um, this woman had had a miscarriage and then suffered violent headache, headaches, and she accused Catherine of being the cause of that. So Catherine was sent to prison, and she was about to be tortured uh, to get to the truth, if torture gets to anything except pain. So um, Kepler, who was in Linz, heard of this and rushed up to the town of Leonberg, where she was, uh, and uh, he was a very significant person, and so they laid off the torture, but it still took him a year to get her out of prison. She then instituted a lawsuit against this other woman, because, as I said, quite an irascible person, but then she died, and so it all went away. Um, <clears throat> The war was getting ever more serious, and, and uh, Kepler's desire to publish the Rudolphine Tables kept getting postponed, and they weren't published until 1628. Uh, and they were published in the German town of Ulm, where several centuries later a very famous another physicist was born, Albert Einstein. Um, because of the, the publication was so significant that Galileo spoke to his boss, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, and, and um, the Duke sent a gold chain to Kepler uh, as congratulations. Um, now, politics and religion were incredibly in, entwined and, and, and difficult, and so, a Protestant like, like um, Kepler was fleeing uh, Catholic Linz, and he was invited to a Polish city of Zagan, uh, which was Catholic, by the Catholic general of, of the Thirty Years' War troops, um, General Wallenstein. And Wallenstein was a great patriot of astrology, and so uh, he wanted the best astronomer to cast horoscopes for him. And so Kepler uh, looked for permission from his boss to move there and, and, and eventually did. So he moved his family to Poland, to this tiny little town of Zagan. Um, but then he set out to go to Regensburg in Germany where the um, emperor and his court were temporarily sitting to try to get the 8,000 crowns, that, which is a significant sum of money, uh, which were due him. Uh, and he was very unsuccessful at this, but 
uh, it was a, a winter journey in terrible weather, and those of you who know what the weather is like in Central Europe will certainly can attest to that. And the fatigue caused him to become really quite ill, and he died in November 1630. Uh, he was buried with significant pomp in the city of Regensburg. However, the area in which he was buried was dug up to build ramparts around the city um, to protect it from uh, during the war. And so the site of his grave was lost, and nobody knows really where it was. Um, in 1803, a famous monument was erected uh, somewhere near to where he was buried. Uh, he left a wife and seven children, two by Barbara and five by Susanna. Um, so he was a, a, an incredible man, an enormously important character. Um, in, there is a famous book about him called The Sleepwalkers, written by Arthur Kessler, and I can recommend that to anybody. Um, and Kepler, who, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Kessler called Kepler the last great humanist scientist, and he really loved him. Uh, and he compares him to Galileo, whom he, call, who he detested and calls the cold, modern, dispassionate scientist. Um, And of course, no scientist today does what Kepler did, was to include his passions and emotions uh, in his, his or her writings. Um, most scientists don't ever even admit that they were ever wrong, let alone admit in a serious, you know, what they thought. Um, now, I want to turn to the starry Galileo. And he did have woes. Even, even Byron had woes as well, of course. Um, he had a very long life and a long career, and filled with all kinds of dramatic uh, events. <clears throat> so much so that the communist Bertolt Brecht has written an entire play about him, which many of you may have seen. His uh, life was and career was full of the greatest noble discoveries, yet they were, he and they were often the subject of considerable derision, um, and uh, mostly from his, his uh, even described as crimes, uh, which would bring the vengeance of heaven down on him. Uh, whereas he was the idol of his friends and favored by nobles and princes, he also became the victim of persecution and spent the last years of his life in a prison atmosphere. Um, this observer of the heavens through a telescope spent the last years of his life completely blind in darkness. He was born in Pisa in 1564, seven years before Kepler. Uh, his ancestors had filled a very high office in, in, in Florence. Pisa was, of course, part of Florence. His father, Vincenzo Galilei, is still well known. He wrote a very famous book on music and was a famous uh, musician, as was Galileo, who became a very fine musician on the lute. But as with so many boys who became serious scientists, uh, his childhood was filled with building toys and pieces of machinery. And unfortunately, Lego didn't exist in his day, but he would have loved that. Um, he enrolled at the University of Pisa to study medicine, but he soon became en entranced by mathematics, particularly Euclidean geometry, the same subject which uh, beguiled I uh, Albert Einstein centuries later. Um, he Oh, and his, well, his father forced him to study medicine, but he objected, and so his father relented and let him study the sciences. Uh, and so he read Archimedes, who was then 
uh, and Archimedes being one of the great intellects of all time. And he published an essay on hydrostatics um, and uh, in terms of this Archimedean thing of determining whether the, the crown was made of gold or brass. Um, that work was so significant, it caught the attention of the brother-in-law of the Duke of Tuscany, who was a very obviously important man. So he was hired by, the, by this brother-in-law to investigate all sorts of things about solid objects, where the center of gravity was, pivot points, etc. And <clears throat> this work was crucial to his future, and because of it, he was appointed a lecturer to Pisa, at the University of Pisa in 1589. Um, he was also already deeply antithetical to, to uh, Aristotelian physics. Um, <clears throat> his resolution was to submit every idea to experimental test. And that to, 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 and that makes him, in some sense, the first real scientist. Um, he was a good lecturer, apparently, and attracted a lot of students. One argument, of course, by Aristotle is that objects fall uh, the speed that depends on their weight, which we all know is nonsense. Um, but, and people had done this for years, dropping objects and tying two objects of different mass together and watching them fall. And it was well known that they fell with the same time, or roughly the same time. And yet, people refused to believe it, what they could see with their own eyes, believing that there was something peculiar about the experiment. Um, some unknown effect rather than a problem with, with the great master. Um, because of Galileo being a, a, an, an acerbic personality, he um, managed to rub Cosimo de' Medici the wrong way, and that's not a good thing to, to have done. So he resolved to leave Pisa because Pisa was under the aegis of, of Florence, and he took the chair uh, of mathematics at the University of Padua, which was part of Venice. Um, of course, Italy was far from being a, a country in those days. And his reputation um, grew rapidly. And in 1597, he was in contact with Kepler and claiming that he had long been converted to Copernicus, and uh, whether that long is true or not. Um, in, he was a sufficiently good lecturer that lots of students flocked to his courses. So in 1606, he was rehired at a higher salary. Um, I think he was hired for periods of six years. Um, so for a second six years at a greatly increased salary. Now, <clears throat> by after 1606, his reputation grew so fast with the students that he often had more than a thousand students coming to his lectures. And so he had to move outdoors with the class. Now, the microphone <clears throat> was invented in uh, 1876. Now, we're now talking about 1606, which is a long time before. How he managed to be heard outdoors by a, a, a group of over 1,000 students is, um, seems not very likely. But nonetheless, um, now, in 1608, a Dutchman named Hans Liberschi uh, wrote a, a patent for a spyglass, the first known telescope. Galileo proceeded to build one in 1609 and was the first we know of to mount it on a stand 
so as to get rid of the motion of, of, of our hands. Uh, and the first we know of to turn the telescope up to the stars. Now, and this telescope that he built ha had a magnification of three, so it wasn't great, because grinding lenses was a tricky business in, in, in his day. Um, <clears throat> So lots of people built telescopes after that. Most of them were quite useless. Galileo managed then to build an eight-power telescope and eventually a 30-power telescope. Um, but clearly, if you are Venetian or are under the control of Venice, a maritime power, and you have the ability to use a telescope and see before anybody else knows that your ship is coming in or not coming in, um, you can then corner the stock market because you know um, what's, what's happening. And so it's obviously of great use. There's a famous story after um, the um, Battle of Waterloo, uh, that, um, which of course the British won. Um, one of the Rothschilds came to, to the bourse in, in Britain and um, everybody knew that the Rothschilds had the, the um, best uh, information system about what went on. So he knew that Wellington had won and Napoleon had lost, but he stood against the column and looked very somber. And so everybody thought, oh, God, we've lost, and they sold stock, in which case he bought them up. <laughs> um, Uh, there's a picture of Mr. Galileo as a young man and as an old man. And his telescope, unlike uh, Lippershey's, which had two um, convex lenses, had a convex and a concave lens. Uh, and this is the way such telescopes are still made today. But Newton eventually, the problem with this is the light has to pass through uh, glass and glass refracts different colors at different angles, and so you get funny color aberration. What um, Newton did was to invent the reflecting telescope, which doesn't have that problem at all. And so little telescopes that you buy off the shelf may, are made like this. The big telescopes of the world are made like this. With this instrument, Galileo was able to show that the, the fixed stars were really very, very far away. Um, in the next year, Galileo made a lot of important discoveries. For example, he turned his telescope on the moon. According to Aristotle, the moon was a perfect orb. And of course, if you look at the moon through a telescope, you see it's full of mountains and craters and all kinds of, of rubbish. Um, and that made also a huge, uh, a huge difference. Um, also, when we see a half moon, say, which is due to the way the sun is shining, very often you can see the missing sort of, p you can see the missing piece. And Galileo understood that the reason for that is that sunlight comes, all, I mean, the, there's no sun falling on the back of the moon, but there is sunlight falling on the earth. The earth reflects the sunlight up to the moon and the moon then reflects a wee bit of that back to us, and so we can see the missing, a little bit of the missing part of the moon. Galileo was the first person to understand that. Um, he noticed that the planets were round disks, but that if you looked at Venus through a telescope, because Venus is closer to the sun, Venus, and you can do this with a good pair of binoculars, Venus has phases just like the moon. 
so that there are time, times when Venus is only a half. Our eyes aren't good enough, but binoculars and telescopes are plenty good enough. Now, his greatest discovery was in the 7th of January, 1610, when he was looking at Jupiter and he saw the moons. Um, he did not know what they are. And to show how he reasons, I want to include some of his observations. The first night, he said, there were two bodies east of Jupiter and one west. And he, I assumed they were fixed stars, he said, paid little attention. But they were on a straight line. And this line was across the equator of the planet Jupiter. Um, then the next night, they were all on the west side of Jupiter. Now, how could that be? How could it lie east of three and the day before it had been west of two? The next night was cloudy, but then he observed again on the 10th, and now only two objects were visible, and both were east of the planet. So it's impossible for Jupiter to have moved back and forth with respect to these, these stars. On the 11th, there were two objects to the east, and one was twice as large as the other. On the previous night, they had been the same. Um, oh, I thought I had a picture of that. Oh, rats. OK. Um, so be it. Um, it became clear to him, of course, that this planet, Jupiter, had its own satellites, the so-called moons of Jupiter. He could see four of them. NASA tells us today that there are 79 moons of Jupiter. He also could see uh, a little bit of Saturn. His telescope wasn't good enough to see the rings, but he could see a bulge at the center. So he couldn't quite distinguish uh, at all. Um, he was, of course, still at Padua, but would visit Florence uh, on his holidays, because that was his home. And then uh, the Duke died in 1609, and his son, who became Duke, invited Galileo to return to his native land from the Venetian territory. And he was to return to Pisa at the highest salary paid to any professor in the history of prof universities at the time. Plus, he had no teaching responsibility unless he wanted to take students, and he could spend all of his time doing his research. So he, uh, um, the book he published about this, the so-called Starry Messenger, um, was published two days after he finished his observations, and he resigned at Padua and returned to Florence. The book caused a lot of excitement in both uh, for it and against it. The, there was a Florentine, Francisco Sisi, who attacked Galileo. And this is Sisi's comment. Seven planets, two favorable, Beneficus ones, two unfavorable, Maleficus, two luminaries, and unique Mercury, erratic and indifferent. In the microcosm, the human head has seven openings, two nostrils, two eyes, two ears, and a mouth. Seven days in the week, seven metals in center. Given the fact that seven is so important, there can't be more planets than seven, so they don't exist. <laughs> I mean, this is a serious argument in 1610. <laughs> now, poor Francesco Sisi, I, I mean, I tend to, we all tend to laugh at him. Uh, he had an end which was not laughable, unfortunately. Um, he, let's see. He left Florence and went to Paris. And he cast a horoscope there for some woman. Now, this woman turned out to be an opponent of Louis XIII. And as an opponent of Louis XIII, she was killed. And because she was killed and because 
uh, CZ had cast a telescope for her. He was broken on the wheel and garroted. And so you can make fun of a scientist, and that's OK. But if you make fun of a king, that's a very dangerous occupation. Um, so I feel actually very sorry for him. Um, 